Clifford Filer on November 17, 1979. Clifford Filer on November 17, 1979. This is an interview with Dr. Clifford Filer on November 17, 1979 for the Lafayette Historical Society. When did you first come to Lafayette, Dr. Filer, and uh, when you first came to set up practice in Lafayette? I first came to Lafayette in the summer of 1939, after I had graduated in medicine from the University of California. And while waiting for my uh, license, I investigated the entire state. I spent three months accumulating a lot of data on the population and the business and the number of doctors and their age and the industries and uh, climate and many things like that. I had huge files that I went through for three months and I picked Lafayette and I've never regretted it. I'm glad you came. Mm -hmm. When I first came to Lafayette, the new tunnel had just opened and uh, the new growth was just about to begin. The uh, population was probably around 15,000 and 1,500. And uh, the population of Walnut Creek wasn't very much greater. I think it was probably about 2,500. Yeah. Uh, at that time, I had difficulty finding a place to rent for my home and my office, and finally I had to settle on a little cottage on Golden Gate Way that is still there on the corner of First Street, across from the old Pioneer store, and that was my home and office. Um, at that time, uh, we didn't have a bus service, and I remember uh, all of us got together, and it was quite difficult to get a bus company to uh, service Lafayette. Greyhound refused to do it. Finally, we got a uh, private bus company that came out from Berkeley and gave us bus service. Well, at the same time, we had no banks and we couldn't get a bank. So finally, I believe it was the Mechanics Bank in Richmond, came out with a trailer. And they took deposits in the trailer for a while, and then they decreed that that was not lawful, and so they closed that. But eventually, they opened the first bank, which is now Lloyd's Bank, in which has actually changed hands three times. And since then, there's been any number of banks, and it's amazing how difficult, difficult it was to get the first bank. Incidentally, when the first bus came through, we had a great big celebration, parade, yeah. and everything else. It was quite an event. And about that time, uh, Lafayette was very uh, well known for its horse show. And we would get uh, entries from all over the state and from Nevada. I happened to be the uh, secretary for several years. The horse show grounds were held on the old uh, dairy that was run by Machado, and this property is now Silver Springs, and it was owned by uh, Dr. What's his name? The, the old doctor that used to ride to school here and horseback and became state president, Oliver... Uh, Hamlin, and then his son, were, uh, Oliver Hamlin, was president of the uh, horse show, and then his son was on there too, Judge O.D. Hamlin, who built Sky High 
ranch. That was all part of that property. But Dr. Hamlin was uh, rather elderly, and uh, he died at the time that the horse show was in about its 11th or 12th year. And uh, that was the end of the horse show, although we did try to develop a horseman's sort of country club in the area that is now Sky Hat High Ranch. And we were taking memberships at around $100 a piece, and we were supposed to get a certain number, and we only were able to get half. So the horse show grounds were sold shortly after. The Machado Dairy went out. At that time, there was another dairy over uh, on... Uh, Near, near the old Kaiser home. Could that have been the Shuey Dairy? Is that Shuey by any chance? Shuey? Yeah, yeah. I think there was another one too. But it was surprising. The cows around here and the dairies. Uh, the uh, other man that was very well known at that time in the horse show was uh, uh, Mr. Frankie, who lived up on Happy Valley. And uh, he had a uh, swimming pool there and had a large uh, picnic area, and he'd have a lot of clubs use it and a lot of friends. And his was one of the first uh, swimming pools. And talking about swimming pools, the uh, other uh, swimming pool was uh, owned by another doctor who had the property that is part mine and part Tanglewood up on Boyer, I mean on uh, Mountain View Drive. Uh, uh, I have a little difficulty recalling names. He was a rather famous doctor and his was another one of the only pools and of course they were very active socially when they had those pools. Now the pools are all over the place. Uh, the horse show uh, would uh, generate a lot of uh, social events. They would have a kangaroo court and a big cage that they would put people in if they didn't have western attire. And uh, then the night before the uh, horse show, they'd have a big uh, horse show dance in the uh, town hall and they'd whoop it up in there so that that building actually swayed <laughs> but uh, the floors are made so that they do bounce up and down and it is really a protective thing uh, they had quite a few dances at the uh, town hall there upstairs and they also used it for uh, uh, recreation and athletics. I remember I was in a group that used to uh, play basketball where the uh, Lafayette Dramatures are on the second floor there uh, every week. So it was a social center? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. in, this uh -huh. is in the 40s? Yes, the early 40s. And... Uh, then it was used quite a bit for the uh, Boy Scouts, the meetings. And actually, for a short time, the downstairs was used as a overflow classroom for the Lafayette School. The uh, church across the street from the uh, Lafayette School, which is now the uh, Masonic uh, Hall, that was also used for a overflow classroom, as well as... Uh, the small buildings before the enlargement of the Lafayette uh, Methodist Church, which was the only church at that time and was a community church, and that is uh, right next to the uh, Fiesta Shopping Center. But those were classrooms for the school. They were spread out all over. At one time, I think a lot of people know that uh, uh, the post office was around there, too. Uh, 
At that time, the uh, new post office was across the street from the uh, play school, which used to be the firehouse, and the post office was next to it. The area that is now the Fiesta Shopping Center was a huge uh, ditch for the creek. And uh, Garibaldi, well, there was a gas station on the corner and a repair, uh, auto repair place. And uh, then Garibaldi bought it and he put a huge concrete uh, sewer in the gully and that Fiesta shopping center actually has a very huge uh, water drainage, concrete water drainage underneath it. That uh, ditch and that creek used to overflow regularly. And as far as that goes, the area around in front of the library in my office used to flood. There were no uh, sewers in and no storm drains. And I remember one winter that was underwater <coughs> for almost two months. Now we're still talking about the 40s, are we? Yes, yes. yes. As late as the 40s. Uh huh. Uh, there was a puddle of water there, maybe uh, six inches to a foot deep there for almost a month. But and then really the, rain, when the sewers it. were put in, they put storm drains in. But even now, you'll notice that every once in a while, the water comes out of the, the storm drains and bubbles up onto the street. It it takes a tremendous uh, amount of water. It is pretty low. Were you but, interested uh, at that time? I know you've been interested for many, many years in the beautification of Lafayette. Were you interested? Was there also a citizens group at that time that was in as early as the 40s that was interested in, in improving uh, Lafayette? There were many groups. Uh, there, uh, most, most of that was uh, done by Boy Scouts on their merit badges, cleaning up and uh, even painting the windows with uh, pretty Halloween pictures at Christmas and sometimes even, I mean at uh, Halloween and, at, and at, even at Christmas. Uh, no, the design project was later. Yes. yes, and uh, I know you were very instrumental in the in the design project. Did it? It started in the early fifties. Is that right? Because we came, my family came in the middle fifties, and it was already. Going. I, I suppose it was. I wasn't in it right at the beginning. Yes, but I was later, and uh, the design project. Oh yes, I remember. Before the design project, yes, there were a number of attempts to uh, beautify Lafayette, and the Improvement Club was very active. Oh, and one very important thing happened, or two, that uh, have finally come to pass, but it took about 35 or 40 years to do it. I was chairman of a uh, committee for the Improvement Club, which was a very active group at that time. And I called a meeting of all of the property owners on Mount Diablo Boulevard. And we got almost a 100% response. We had a dinner meeting in the old uh, Legion Hall. And many of these people, many of these owners, were from out of town. And the unfortunate thing was the Improvement Club called this meeting, but they didn't want to go on and continue sponsorship. So at the meeting, we <coughs> discussed beautifying the Mount Diablo Boulevard, the main street, by having some conformity of all of the buildings there and having them turned around 
So they had an egg, uh, entrance in the back along the creek and trying to develop a parkway and a pedestrian way so that you had, and had parking in the back there so that you would have entrance on the main street and on uh, this parkway. They all agreed to it. They appointed their own chairman. He never called a meeting and it fell flat. It was t too bad. Yeah. Then about that time, we tried another thing to improve the strip so-called at that time, which was uh, dominated by gas stations and nightclubs. Uh, and uh, I was chairman of a committee I believe it was probably the the uh, Improvement Club again. And I got some architects from UC to draw up a plan where we would have a similar sort of arrangement with a parallel street running from Moraga Road to either Mountain View or all the way to Sunset Boulevard. And we could have opened up and put a street through there with the purchase of only two lots. And this was published in the paper. And unfortunately, there was some criticism and it was just dropped because there were a few people that thought somebody was doing this for financial um, gain and there was no he would have been so much of no a no evidence of anything like that at all well now they're doing almost that with their peacock with their uh lafayette circle but they could have opened up Lafayette Circle to um, uh, doing Avenue, one lot. And then uh, that would have carried them all the way through to Mountain View Boulevard. Yeah. And there was only one not, lot needed somewhere around the church here. And those two lots would have opened up a direct street and a uh, better arranged shopping center. Well, we're finally being forced to uh, do something like that, but it isn't as easy and it isn't quite as good as it would have been if they would have uh, ex yes. uh, gone through with this at that time. Yes, because there's so many more uh, buildings, so many more owners. Yes. So now. But then we had a number of meetings uh, trying to uh, get trees and beautify Lafayette and all that. And uh, they never uh, materialized, the, the results of these discussions never materialized until finally, a uh, few, few years later, uh, the group got together and uh, formed the design project. Well, the design project was able to put the center strips in and the trees and the undergrounding of the telephone wires and the uh, correction of the signs, which were a terrible jungle. And uh, the design project would sell trees to the uh, community to increase uh, the number of trees in Lafayette. And uh, they did just about everything that the uh, city government now does. We had committees, when I was chairman of it, that were similar to every uh, single commission that the city has. And they were very, very active. They had to report on their progress, the committee progress, every single month, or there were new people assigned to it. And so every single committee was extremely active. The thing that they didn't like was that they had to go to Martinez so much for... Uh, all of these hearings on the signs and the different uh, new uh, planning uh, things. And so uh, they uh, 
thought they would prefer to have uh, uh, local representation. Well, that was the second time, because once before they had voted it down, incorporation. But the design project uh, loaned them the funds to go through with it, and uh, the design project uh, was very instrumental in the city incorporating. Mm -hmm. Then when the city did incorporate, mm -hmm. most, yeah, 1968, the telephone mm -hmm. number is 284 of the city, 1968. Mm -hmm. Very That's nice, easy to very, remember. Yes, very nice. <laughs> yes. And when they did incorporate, uh, our past president was the mm -hmm. first mayor of uh, Lafayette. And uh, well, Don Black. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, Don Black. And uh, I believe well over uh, 50 or at least 50 percent of the uh, city uh, commissioners and that were uh, trained and had come from the design project. At that time, the design project met every single uh, month with the uh, supervisor, and they uh, worked also with the uh, Chamber of Commerce. They had representatives from all of the groups and the uh, uh, Improvement Club. And they were the closest thing to a... Uh, government that we had, and we actually did have a contract with the county to hire the people to do the landscaping. And then we had the Bucks for Beauty Drive, and that was very, very successful. I was chairman of that for many years, and uh, we used that money to improve the uh, character of Lafayette. We had also, before the design project was uh, developed, a uh, analysis by the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation of the type of thing that we should do to improve Lafayette. Uh, that was a, a donation by the foundation. There is a published uh, report on that. Yes, I believe it's in the library. Yeah. Uh, in the library, not mm -hmm. the library. Yes, so a great deal of planning went into uh, the incorporation of Lafayette. And, yes. Uh, there, the there's, been, there's been a great deal of citizen response. Yes. It's really uh, tremendous. The other thing that the design project did was uh, we would award certificates of merit every year for the best new buildings, the best landscaping, and this would apply to apartments and commercial buildings, and uh, the best remodeling. And then I was the perennial chairman of that, and we would always have professionals uh, uh, on the committee as uh, judges. I think it probably stimulated, uh, well, I know it did, because it did. many times uh, we would tell people we would give them an, an award if they painted and uh, planted and this sort of thing, and then they would yeah. to get that a stimulating yes, thing. Yeah. award of merit. Yeah. Uh, Do you think somebody asked me about... Uh, Eugene O'Neill, the uh, yes, playwright. Yes, you have to tell us a little bit about some and, of your patients. Uh, yes. Well, in as much as uh, all of the uh, O'Neill family are gone now, except uh, Una, his daughter, I guess I can discuss it. I think it would be uh, interesting. He first came to Lafayette, and he rented uh, E.K. Woods, home on Charles Hill, and this is now a uh, very beautiful residential development. The original home is still there, overlooking Mount Diablo, and this was another home, one of the first ones, that had a swimming pool. Well, and he rented that, that for a while. I don't think many people know that. And uh, I believe that's how he became enamored with this area. 
And uh, then he built a home between Danville and Alamo called Tao's House, which means before peace you, or something. Before you tell me about that, Dr. Potter, I think I'm going to have to turn over the okay. key. Would you like to continue, uh, Dr. Fido, with uh, telling us about Eugene O'Neill, one of your Yes. Questions? Now, Eugene O'Neill's wife's daughter, or his daughter-in-law, lived in Lafayette on Mountain View Drive in the house that has the poplar trees on the corner of Brook, Roy Stram and Cynthia Stram, and then they had a uh, boy. And uh, her mother was Carlotta O'Neill, an actress, and O'Neill, I think it was his second wife. Uh, when he lived out here, Cynthia was a very good friend of mine, the family was, and she uh, asked me to uh, see uh, Eugene O'Neill, who had just built this house in uh, Danville. And uh, so after that, uh, I saw him regularly, and I was his uh, physician. Uh, at that time, O'Neill was quite a recluse because he had a very severe case of palsy. Oh, yes, already. Yes. This is what, yes. what year, about what year is it? The well, I think it was in the war years, in the, in 40s. In the 40s. Yes. And he'd already had this advanced case of palsy. Yes. yes. And so he was very embarrassed about appearing in public. And uh, even when I came to see him, uh, he I had to tell him when I was coming, and they'd open the gate, and uh, it was impossible to get servants at that time. They had one for a while, but then they didn't. And uh, frequently he would answer the door. He would not answer unless he knew who it was. And uh, O'Neill was born the same day I was. O'Neill had done newspaper work the same as I. O'Neill had had TB similar to me when I was young. O'Neill had been to uh, Haiti, to Christoph's Citadel, and had had, had malaria there and all, and I had been there. So we had a great deal in common to talk about. I'd spend an hour at least on a visit. He was an extremely interesting uh, conversationalist. His home was very, very interesting, too. Uh, every room had uh, shelves of library books, even the hallway, and the books were typical of the room that they were in. For example, the kitchen was full of all kinds of cookbooks. Yeah. And then he had a little room with a uh, piano that is rather famous, a uh, player piano, and he had a lot of music and records in there, and he liked uh, the uh, jazz music. Incidentally, uh, he played it quite a bit. He played the but piano? The, the player piano. The player piano. Uh -huh. But uh, I was there the day that uh, his daughter, his youngest daughter, Una, who had been the uh, debutante in New York the year before, the debutante of the year, and then the next year she married Charlie Chaplin, who was considered a sort of a roué character. He'd had some paternity suits and everything else and lots of marriages. And uh, uh, O'Neill had no use for Charlie Chaplin. And he was really down in the dumps. And all the shades were drawn that day, the day they were married, that I was at their home, and no music or anything else. It was really pathetic. Marriage did last. It was really remarkable. And uh, she evidently did a lot for uh, uh, Chaplin. But... Uh, but O'Neill disapproved very much. Oh, yes, yes. Uh -huh. And he also was uh, very 
nationally known critic of Hitler. He had Mein Kampf book there, uh, incidentally, and uh, he had uh, really been very critical of Hitler. Oh, uh, he also said that he had written a lot of books that had are plays. He was considered the American Americans number one playwright. Uh, and they had been translated in Russian, and he had a great deal of money in Russia, but he couldn't take it out unless he went to Russia, but he wouldn't do it. Uh, concerning his palsy, his hand would shake so much that he would tie a towel around his wrist, pull it up around his neck, and pull his hand to his mouth when he took a drink of water. It would shake so much. It was really pathetic. We tried to, uh, get some of the new medicines, but they were too experimental and he didn't want to try them. Now, there are things that do improve that. At that time, he was writing a series of sort of historical uh, plays, and Cynthia Stram was uh, doing the typing for him. And uh, some of his most important plays were written in uh, the Tahoe's home. The Tahoe's home was a very beautiful home. Uh, it overlooked Mount Diablo. It had a big picture window overlooking Mount Diablo. And then on the opposite wall was a sort of a blue wall mirror. And if you were facing the inside wall, you'd see Diablo. This huge wall was just a picture of uh, Diablo, very beautiful. He had, uh, I don't know, 50 or 100 acres, and he had a chicken house there, and he used to raise uh, white leghorn uh, hens. He also had a very famous dog, and he's buried in the garden there. Mrs. O'Neill. This is Carlotta. Yes, Carlotta O'Neill. Uh, could really control him. In what way? Oh, she just bossed him around and just treated him like a little boy and did everything for him. She was really real good to him, but real bossy. She was a actor from the word, actress from the word go. She was always acting. She was beautiful, but it was just as if she was on the stage all the time. And she would, uh, take me into the kitchen, and she was a very gourmet cook, and she'd fix special things and, and give me samples of it. And, uh... You feel that she was really good for the Oh, yes. Yeah. That, yes. Well, I've heard people say that she was an ogre, but you felt that she was really, she had his interest at heart, his medical... Uh, oh, I, I believe so. I think she had his welfare at heart, but, uh... <clears throat> When they, uh, she, I think she was the one that made the move. He didn't really want to move. But she wanted to get back into things. She wanted to get back into San Francisco first, and that wasn't enough. And then they went to New York. And they wanted to be around the theater, or she did. And when they went back, uh, they had a uh, great many battles, and uh, she was declared uh, insane. And uh, then... The doctors back there uh, phoned me near the time that she passed away and uh, wanted to know about her mother, Mrs. Starshin, that used to live at uh, Cynthia Stram. And then I had her in a rest home in Berkeley near the Claremont Hotel. And uh, she uh, was the same, too. It was a senile thing, a, a deterioration. And uh, then she passed away. And it was very interesting that uh, Carlotta followed almost the same course. And they called me to find out about it. Yeah, she had mental deterioration. And uh, I believe uh, O'Neill had a little mental problem there at the very end, too. Uh, he had, uh, liked his alcohol, but he had it 
well controlled when I knew him. Yeah. He had the uh, kindest eyes and saddest looking face and expression, but he was really a sort of an overwhelming personality. He was really a tremendous guy, brilliant, and calm, a peaceful sort of a person, but yet uh, pathetic because he had to be uh, a uh, somewhat of a, a hermit yes, because of his uh, palsy. Do you happen to have any photographs of uh, uh, the, uh, Howell's house when he uh, uh, attended? No, uh, I, I'm a uh, member of the uh, foundation that has finally gotten the government to declare that a historical monument and the state is now going to manage it and they're still in the process of figuring out what to do with it and how how to get a adequate access to it. But they have a lot of pictures. They have some pictures of me with uh, O'Neill and pictures of the house and the house is being restored and all. I haven't been over there recently. But uh, that uh, historical society has is very active and they're still active and they have a lot of those uh, pictures and I believe it's sort of a uh, museum dedicated to uh, um, O'Neill. Yeah. O'Neill had uh, a biographer that wrote two books and he came out here and uh, I had talked to him about O'Neill he was gathering information and uh, his books are tremendous, very, very active. He spent years, and he had, uh, I think, a Guggenheim scholarship to do it. And uh, they're very, very complete as far as uh, O'Neill's uh, life goes. He has a lot of pictures in there, too. Oh, I just thought maybe if you had some photographs, it might be of interest to the, to, to the foundation uh, at uh, Tower's House. Do you have, speaking no, no. of photographs, do you happen to have any photographs of early Lafayette that, have you seen any, have you seen our collection in the Lafayette Library? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Filer, would you like to tell us a little bit about how your practice differs now from what it was like uh, in the, in 1939 when you came to Lafayette? Well, uh, at that time, being a family doctor, or general practitioner, uh, you made house calls. And every morning, I would make many house calls. I was the only doctor for probably five or more years for Lafayette, Rinda, Canyon, Raga, and Walnut Creek only had two doctors and a part-time doctor, two and a half, all through the war. And now there's probably 350 in Walnut Creek with the uh, Kaiser Hospital. Oh, there have been many moves to get that hospital, the John Muir Hospital. And I could tell you a great deal about the history of the hospitals around here and the political campaigns even. That was on the ballots and all. Uh, but anyway, uh, I had to make uh, many, many house calls, day and night, and uh, I have delivered 2,500 babies. I don't do any deliveries now, but that's more than the population when I came here. <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, Hospitals, we had to go to, I had to belong to six or seven hospital staffs at a time. There was none in Walnut Creek, none in Lafayette. We had this three-lane suicide uh, highway with the center strip. And we had to go into Alda Bates and Berkeley, Herrick, and uh, Children's and Kill Hill, the three hospitals, Martinez and little community hospital in Concord. 
And sometimes I had to go to all of those, and I'd even have to go as far as Clayton and Diablo on house calls, and all over the hills that are so confusing in uh, uh, Orenda. Uh, it was very interesting. I was throwing away some old charts, and the janitor saw them, and uh, he kept a few of them because he was amazed. House calls were one dollar, office calls were two dollars. <laughs> a delivery was fifty dollars, and that included the nine months of care plus well baby care for six weeks after, and many house calls uh, after the delivery to check the mother and the baby. And they used to keep the mother in in bed for ten days at that time. Uh, UC started getting them up out of bed on the third day, and when I started doing that, uh, one of the hospitals, I won't mention the name, threatened to throw me off the staff. But in a year, they were all doing it. But by the time the year was over, I was getting them up the first day. And they complained again, but in a year, they were all doing it again. At that time, I was doing quite a bit of uh, research on new medicines. And uh, I actually was the first one to have immune globulin. All of it was manufactured by Cutter Lab, and all of it went to the armed services. But they gave me 300 vials for investigational purposes. And uh, I certainly used it. We had some terrible epidemics of chickenpox and measles. And uh, this helped a great deal in the relief of some of these cases that didn't cure it, but it helped relieve it. Uh, I had the first penicillin, yes. and when they sent it to me, it was insured for about $85, and it was a million units, and a million units you would get for about 15 cents now. And I wondered at that time when it would be like aspirin. Well, it's almost that now. I had the first cortisone. And that was very, very expensive, and I remember using it on a man that had a bone infection, osteomyelitis, for a couple of years. And I don't know how it cleared it up, but uh, in, in uh, one course of treatment, that was cleared up with that and uh, penicillin. At that time, uh, bone infections were treated with live maggots. It was horrible. You'd buy them and put them on and wrap them up and they'd eat away all of the dead tissue and keep the, the wound clean. And it would take months and months to heal. As far as uh, venereal diseases go, uh, we didn't see as much then, but when we did see it, there was a familiar saying, uh, one night with Venus, the rest of your life with mercury because it would take years of arsenic and mercury and bismuth injections in the vein and in the muscle and uh, potassium uh, permanganate per per uh, washings and you still wouldn't cure them and then they started using fever therapy for brain syphilis but now good lord almost one Big shot of penicillin clears them both up. So that uh, is a major yeah. thing. But yeah. the other thing was the uh, not just the way they looked at abortions. It was a horrible criminal crime, and you'd lose your license. But uh, there were patients that we would have that would have their health markedly jeopardized by having too many babies. And so uh, there was the uh, tubal ligation for sterility and the vasoligation ligation for the male. And that was looked upon almost like an abortion. And you had to have three doctors uh, consent to it before it could be done. It was really funny. Uh, you know, in 1939, there was no 
penicillin, sulfur was the very first antibiotic that made people very sick. And when I first came to Lafayette, at that time, real husky people would get pneumonia and they'd be gone the next day. It was the primary cause of death and it was a huge cause of death. Well, I had uh, several cases when I first came to Lafayette that got pneumonia. And we were real concerned and worried. And we gave them the sulfur until they were actually blue. But thank God I made my reputation and saved them. <laughs> I had just been out of UC and I thought, oh, he really knows. <laughs> but I was just fortunate in that we had sulfur. The sulfur nowadays doesn't make them so toxic and so ill and it's much more effective. Uh, the uh, medicines that we use now, see this is 41 years ago, uh, we had none of them in the 30s. We didn't have the vaccines. I remember a epidemic of polio and I saw 32 cases of polio in this county in one year and the total was only about 45 but I think a lot of them weren't recognizing it but we had a scout troop that got it and a couple of them died of it when they came back from the troop with it one of them died in my arms we used to have to give them a lot of uh, artificial respiration the, the respirator and we had to send them to the uh, County. I remember uh, I had one patient that was about 60 years old and it was unheard of for them to have polio and uh, we saved him with a respirator. I had another one that uh, they didn't have room for at the county hospital with their respirator. They didn't have respirators and I took him in my own car, rushed him over the over the uh, bridge to the San Francisco General Hospital where I knew the chief of infectious diseases and the head of the hospital, Geiger, who was a very famous doctor. And uh, they uh, saved him, but uh, I really was called on the carpet for taking a contagious disease <laughs> through two counties, <laughs> but Geiger finally uh, excused me for it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's really illegal to transport them across uh, county lines, but we didn't have any other means of uh, treating them. Uh, well, it, a lot of changes. Yes, uh, I remember uh, in the early 40s we first recognized uh, measles in mothers as the cause of uh, birth defects, deafness, blindness, stunted growth, and that sort of thing. And uh, now with the uh, measles vaccine, that's practically eliminated. But that was a very terrible thing, and we didn't know what caused these things when, when we found them. And it was in the 40s that they first found a uh, connection between the two. Uh, I think one of the greatest uh, new developments in medicine is uh, the elimination of maybe half of our psychiatrists by the use of mood elevating and uh, medications that uh, affect the brain chemistry. And they really are saving a lot of lives because uh, these people, we would uh, lose them as suicides from depression and all. And now we're saving them without a lot of long therapy on the couch. It's just the medication, the uh, brain chemistry. That's a really so big So it's, uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, much more gratifying for us to practice medicine. You have so much more to work with. And as I say, about the only thing that I use now that uh, I was taught in uh, 
in the field of pharmacy when I was in medical school is uh, maybe aspirin, which is an extremely good medicine. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. Always have plenty on hand. Well, Dr. Oh. Feiler, I want to thank you for taking your busy Saturday morning and giving us an interview of uh, Life in Lafayette from the red days when you came here and to 1970.